Socialism Utopian and Scientific by Frederick Engels, Part 2, or Chapter 2, Dialectics. In the meantime, along with and after the French philosophy of the 18th century had arisen the new German philosophy, culminating in Hegel. Its great, its greatest merit was the taking up again of dialectics as the highest form of reasoning. The old Greek philosophers were all born natural dialecticians. And Aristotle, the most in encyclopedic of them, had already analyzed the most essential forms of dialectic thought. The newer philosophy, on the other hand, although in it also dialectics had brilliant exponents, e.g. Descartes and Spinoza, had especially through English influence become more and more rigidly fixed in the so-called metaphysical mode of reasoning, by which also the French of the 18th century were almost wholly dominated. At all events in their special philosophical work, outside philosophy in the restricted sense, the French nevertheless produced masterpieces of dialectic. <clears throat> We need only call to mind Diderot's Le Niveau de Rameau and Rousseau's Discours sur l'origine et les fondements de l'inégalité <laughs> parmi les hommes. We give here in brief the essential character of these two modes of thought. When we consider and reflect upon nature at large, or the history of mankind, or our own intellectual activity, at first we see the picture of an endless entanglement of relations and reactions, permutations and combinations, in which nothing remains what, where, and as it was, but everything moves, changes, comes into being, and passes away. We see, therefore, at first, the picture as a whole, with its individual parts still more or less kept in the background, we observe the movements, transitions, connections, rather than the things that move, combine, and are connected. This primitive, naive, but intrinsically correct conception of the world is that of ancient Greek philosophy, and, it was, and was first clearly formulated by Heraclitus. Everything is and is not, for everything is fluid, is constantly changing, constantly coming into being and passing away. <clears throat> but this conception correctly as it expresses the general character of the picture of appearances as a whole does not suffice, suffice to explain the details of which this picture is made up. And so long as we do not understand these, we have not a clear idea of the whole picture. In order to understand these details, we must detach them from their natural, special causes, effects, etc. This is primarily the task of natural science and historical research. Branches of science, which the Greek of classical times on very good grounds relegated <clears throat> to a subordinate position because they had first of all to collect materials for these sciences to work upon. A certain amount of natural and historical material must be collected before there can be any critical analysis, comparison, and arrangement in classes, orders, and species. The foundations of the exact natural sciences were, therefore, first worked out by the Greeks of the Alexandrian period, and later on in the Middle Ages by the Arabs. Real natural science dates from the second half of the 15th century, and thence onward it had advanced with constantly increasing rapidity. The analysis of nature into its individual parts, the grouping of the different natural processes and objects in definite classes, the study of the internal anatomy of organized bodies in their manifold forms, these were the fundamental conditions of the gigantic strides in our knowledge of nature that have been made during the last 400 years. But this method of work has also left us, as legacy, the habit of observing natural objects and processes in isolation, apart from their connection with the vast whole of observing them in repose, not in motion, 
as constraints, not as essentially variables, in their death, not in their life. And when this way of looking at things was transferred by Bacon and Locke from natural science to philosophy, it begot the narrow metaphysical mode of thought peculiar to the last century. To the metaphysician, things and their mental reflexes, ideas are isolated, are to be considered one after the other and apart from each other, are objects of investigation, fixed, rigid, given once for all. He thinks in absolutely irreconcilable antitheses. His communication is yeah, yeah, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Oh, okay. For him, a thing either exists or does not exist. A thing cannot at the same time be itself in something else. Positive and negative absolutely exclude one another. Cause and effect stand in a rigid antithesis one to the other. At first sight, this mode of thinking seems to us very luminous because it is that of social sound common sense. Only sound common sense respectable fellow that he is in the homely realm of his own four walls has very wonderful adventures directly. He ventures out into the wide world of research. And the metaphysical mode of thought, justifiable and necessary as it is in a number of domains, whose extent varies according to the nature of the particular object of investigation, sooner or later reaches a limit, beyond which it becomes one-sided, restricted, abstract, lost in insoluble contradictions. In the contemplation of individual things, it forgets the connection between them. In the contemplation of their existence, it forgets the beginning and end of that existence, of their repose, it forgets their motion. It cannot see the woods for the trees. For everyday purposes, we know and can say, e.g. whether an animal is alive or not. But upon closer inquiry, we find that his is, in many cases, a very complex question. As the jurists know very well, they have cudgeled their brains in vain to discover a rational limit beyond which the killing of the child in its mother's womb is murder. It is just as pos impossible to determine absolutely the moment of death, for physiology proves that death is not an instantaneous momentary phenomenon, but a very protracted process. In like manner, every organized being is every moment the same and not the same. Every moment, it assimilates matter supplied from without and gets rid of other matter. Every moment, some cells of its body die and others build themselves anew. In a longer or shorter time, the matter of its body is completely renewed and is replaced by other molecules of matter so that every organized being is always itself and yet something other than itself. <clears throat> Further, we find upon closer investigation that the two poles of an antithesis, positive and negative, e.g., are as inseparable as they are opposed, and that despite all their opposition, they mutually interpenetrate. And we find in like manner that cause and effect are conceptions which only hold good in their application to individual cases, but as soon as we consider the individual cases in their general connection with the universe as a whole, they run into each other and they become confounded when we contemplate that universal action and reaction in which causes and effects are eternally changing places so that what is effect here and now will be cause there and then and vice versa. None of these processes and modes of thought enters into the framework of metaphysical reasoning. Dialectics, on the other hand, comprehends things and their representations, ideas, and their essential connection, concat concatenation, motion, origin, and ending. Such processes as those mentioned above are, therefore, so many corrobor corroborations of its own method of procedure. Nature is the proof of dialectics, and it must be said for modern science that it has furnished this proof, proof with very rich materials increasingly daily, and thus has shown that, in the last resort, nature works dialectically and not metaphysically. 
that she does not move in the eternal oneness of a perpetually recurring circle, but goes through a real historical evolution. In this connection, Darwin must be named before all others. He dealt the metaphysical conception of nature the heaviest blow by his proof that all organic beings, plants, animals, and man himself are the products of a process of evolution going on through millions of years. But the naturalists who have learned to think dialectically are few and far between, and this conflict of the results of discovery with preconceived modes of thinking explains the endless confusion now reigning in theoretical natural science, the despair of teachers as well as learners of authors and readers alike. An exact representation of the universe, of its evolution, of the development of mankind, and of the reflection of this evolution in the minds of men can therefore only be obtained by the methods of dialectics, with its constant regard to the innumerable actions and reactions of life and death, of progressive or retrogressive changes. And in this spirit, the new German philosophy has worked. Kant began his career by resolving the stable solar system of Newton and its eternal duration after the famous initial impulse and once been given into the result of a historical process, the formation of the sun and all the planets out of a rotating nebulous mass. From this, he at the same time drew the conclusion that, given this origin of the solar system, its future death followed of necessity. His theory, half a century later, was established mathematically by Laplace, and half a century after that, the spectroscope, the spectroscope proved the existence in space of such incandescent masses of gas in various stages of condensation. This new German philosophy culminated in the Hegelian system. In this system, and herein is its great merit, for the first time, the whole world, natural, historical, intellectual, is represented as a process, i.e. as in constant motion, change, transformation, development, and the attempt is made to trade out into the eternal connection that makes a continuous whole of all this movement and development. From this point of view, the history of mankind no longer appeared as a wild whirl of senseless deeds of violence, all equally condemned condemnable at the judgment seat of mature philosophic reason and which are best forgotten as quickly as possible, but as the process of evolution of man himself. It was now the task of the intellect to follow the gradual march of this process through all its devious ways and to trace out the inner law running through all its apparently accidental phenomena. That the Hegelian system did not solve the problem it propounded is here Im immaterial. Its epoch-making merit was that it propounded the problem. This problem is one that no single individual will ever be able to solve. Although Hegel was, with St. Simon, the most encyclopedic mind of his time, yet he was limited, first, by the necessary limited extent of his own knowledge and second, by the limited extent and depth of the knowledge and conceptions of his age. To these limits, a third must be added. Hegel was an idealist. To him, the thoughts within his brain were not the more or less abstract pictures of actual things and processes, but conversely, things in their evolution were only the realized thoughts within his brain. Oh, oh shit were only the realized pictures of the idea, existing somewhere from eternity before the world was. This way of thinking turned everything upside down and completely reversed the actual connection of things in the world. Correctly and ingeniously, as many groups of facts were grasped by Hegel, yet for the reasons just given, there is much that is actual, that is botched, artificial, labored, in a word, wrong in point of detail. The Hegelian system in itself was a colossal miscarriage, but it was also the last of its kind. It was suffering, in fact, from an internal and incurable contradiction. Upon the one hand, its essential proposition was the conception that human history is a process of evolution, which by its very nature cannot find its intellectual final term in the discovery of any so-called absolute truth. 
but on the other hand, it laid claim to being the very essence of this absolute truth. A system of natural and historical knowledge embracing everything and final for all time is a contradiction to fundamental law of dialectical reason. This law indeed by no means excludes, but on the contrary, includes the idea that the systematic knowledge of the external universe can make giant strides from age to age. The perception of the fundamental contradiction in German idealism led necessarily back to materialism, but nota bene, not to the simply metaphysical, exclusively mechanical materialism of the 18th century. Old materialism looked upon all previous history as a crude heap of irrationality and violence. Modern materialism sees in it the process of evolution of humanity and aims at discovering the laws thereof. With the French of the 18th century and even with Hegel, the conception obtained of nature as a whole moving in narrow circles and for forever immutable with its in eternal celestial bodies as Newton and unalterable unalter organic species as Linnaeus taught. Modern materialism embraces the more recent discoveries of natural science, according to which nature also has its history in time. He, oh, oh fuck, these celestial bodies, like the organic species that under favorable, favorable conditions, people them, being born and perishing, and even if nature as a whole must still be said to move in recurrent cycles, these cycles assume infinitely larger dimensions. In both aspects, modern materialism is essentially dialectic. It no longer requires the assistance of that sort of philosophy which, queen-like, pretended to rule the remaining mob of sciences. As soon as each special science is bound to make clear its position in the great totality of things and of our knowledge of things, a special science dealing with its totality is superfluous or unnecessary. That which still survives of all earlier philosophy is the science of thought and its law, formal logic and dialectics. Everything else is subsumed in the positive science of nature and history. Whilst, however, the revolution in the conception of nature could only be made in proportion to the corresponding positive materials furnished by research, already much earlier certain historical facts had occurred which led to a decisive change in the conception of history. In 1831, the first working class rising took place in Lyon. Between 1838 and 1842, the first national working class movement, that of the English Chartists, reached its height. The class struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie came to the front of the came to the front in the history of the most advanced countries in Europe. In proportion to the development upon the one hand of modern industry, upon the other of the newly acquired political supremacy of the bourgeoisie. Facts more and more strenuously gave the lie to the teachings of bourgeois economy as to the identity of the interests of capital and labor, as to the universal harmony and universal prosperity that would be the consequence of unbridled competition. All these things could no longer be ignored any more than the French and English socialism, which was their theoretical, though very imperfect, expression. But the old idealist conception of history, which was not yet dislodged, knew nothing of class struggles based upon economic interests, knew nothing of economic interests. Production in all economic relations appeared in it only as incidental, subordinate elements in the history of civilization. The new facts made imperative a new examination of all past history. Then it was seen that all past history, with the exception of its primitive stages, was the history of class struggles, that these warring classes of society are always the products of the modes of production and of exchange. In a world of the economic conditions of their time, 
that the economic structure of society always furnishes the real basis, starting from, from which we can alone work out the ultimate explanation of the whole metaphysics, of the whole superstructure, fuck, of the whole superstructure of juridical and political institutions, as well as of the religious, philosophical, and other ideas of a given historical period. Hegel has freed history from metaphysics. He made it dialectic, but his conception of history was essentially idealistic. But now idealism was driven from its last refuge, the philosophy of history. Now a materialistic treatment of history was propounded and a method found of explaining man's knowing by his being instead of as heretofore his being by his knowing. From that time forward, socialism was no longer an accidental discovery of this or that ingenious brain, but the necessary outcome of the struggle between two historically developed classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Its task was no longer to manufacture a system of society as perfect as possible, but to examine the historical economic succession of events from which these classes and their antagonism had of necessity sprung and to discover in the economic conditions thus created the means of ending the conflict. But the socialism of earlier days was as incompatible with this materialist conception as the conception of nature of the French materialist was with dialectics and modern natural science. The socialism of earlier days certainly criticized the existing capitalistic mode of production and its consequences, but it could not explain them and therefore could not get the mastery of them. It could only simply reject them as bad. The more strongly this earlier socialism denounced the exploitations of the working class, inevit inevitable under capitalism, the less able was it clearly to show in what this exploitation consisted and how it arose. Before this, it was necessary. To present the capitalistic mode of production in its historical connection and its inevitableness during a particular historical period, and therefore also to present its inevitable downfall and to lay bare its essential character, which was still a secret, this was done by the discovery of surplus value. It was shown that the appropriation of unpaid labor is the basis of the capitalist mode of production and of the exploitation of the worker that occurs under it. That even if the capitalist buys the labor power of his laborer at its full value as a commodity on the market, he yet extracts more value from it than he paid for. And that in the ultimate analysis, the surplus value forms those sums of value from which are heaped up constantly increasing masses of capital in the hands of the possessing classes. The genesis of capitalist production and the production of capital were both explained. These two great discoveries, the materialistic conception of history and the revelation of the secret of capitalistic production through surplus, surplus value, we owe to Marx. With these discoveries, socialism became a science. The next thing was to work out all its details and relations.